um, continuing on with the um, chapter here, chapter 9, on the um, sphere of Mahos, where we uh, spoke yesterday about how, um, well, if the first way in which we can connect to the sphere of Mahos is through anava, humility, the second way that we saw yesterday was elaborating on um, uh, connecting to Malchus through, through empathizing with the, the, the nature of exile and um, avoiding material comforts out of empathy for, uh, for Malchus, which is an exile. A person should say, for example, um, when the Shekhinah was in her home, the throne, the base of Migdash, she, as it were, had her vessels, her, 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 her belongings, the Shulchan, the Menorah, the um, Aron Abris, and these types of things. So now as a result of the exile, the Shekhinah has been exiled from Yushalayim, from the base of Migdash, and it's wandering like a forlorn widow across the world with nothing, none of its own belongings, as it were. So how can I um, indulge myself with uh, many different types of belongings, both in qu- qualitatively and quantitatively? Therefore, a person should minimize the types of material comforts that he has in order to empathize with the Shekhinah. This, in a way, really um, kind of, con- I guess, consoles the Shekhinah, which, uh, which does have, if not a way of necessarily restoring the Shekhinah back to the Melech, but nevertheless consoles the Shekhinah. Um, and, and, and that would therefore be another way of connecting to the sphere of Malchus. Now on, on page Ein Aleph, he, he continues and says a, a third way in which we can connect to Malchus. Od mi bidas Malchus, mi od. There is another attribute of Malchus, which is very important. Shar ha'avoida kula, which is a gate for all of the service of Hashem. So that Malchus becomes like a gate to serving Hashem in, in many other different ways as well. That kind of makes sense insofar as Malchus is the sphere that includes within it all of the other spheros. So that as we're trying to serve Hashem, approaching first through Malchus, Malchus becomes a gateway, therefore, to access all of the Midos which are within Malchus itself. We actually find that... Uh, Malchus is corresponding to the name of Hashem Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. We've spoken about that in the past a little bit, where we said that the sphere of Teferis is, is connected Yud Ke Vav Ke, and um, Malchus would be Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. And if you take the letters of, of Aleph Dalad Nun Yud and spell that out, you'd have Aleph Lamed Pe, right? that would be Aleph, and then Dalit. Dalid, Lamid, Taf. Mm-hmm. And then Nun would be Nun, Vav, Nun. Right? And then Yud, Yud, Vav, Dalid. If you were to take the, that's called the Milui, where you take not just the letter, but the way the letter is spelled, and use those letters of the way the letter is spelled as the Gematria. That's called a Milui. So if you take the, the Gematria of a Milui of Aleph, Dalid, Nun, Yud, you actually get the same gematria as ta'ara, where ta'ara is the Aramaic word for shar. Taf, ein, resh, aleph. Taf, resh, ein, aleph. So that adnus in the milui is the same as ta'ara, which means that this is a remez to the fact that the sphere of malchus, which is connected the name aleph, dal, nun, yud, is actually um, suggestive of a ta'ara, a shar, a gate. And that fits in with what he's saying here as well that the Malchus becomes a shar for a gateway to all of the other Midos. You can try that out at your leisure if you're good at math. Ta'ara. That would be 671. Where the Taf is 400, the Resh is 200, Ayn is 70, and Aleph is 1. So it's 671. That's the milu of Aleph Dal Nun Yud. Vehi the Yirma Sashem Hanichbad Vahanoira. And this gateway, the Malchus, 
the way of connecting to the Malchus is through having Gir Hashem, fear of God, Hanichbad Vahanoira, who is elevated and glorious. And we're not talking about fearing Hashem in the lower form of the fear of punishment, but it means being awe of Hashem. It's contemplating the, the Mita of Malchus in one's humility and recognizing in, in that the greatness of God and trembling before God out of fear of awe, but not of punishment. And that would be the Mita of Malchus. Fihine. Haigira mesukenes me'od Yura, serving Hashem out of fear, has its dangers, that it is subject to being tainted by the chitzonim, negative spiritual forces. Why? Shehari im higira min yisurim, o min amisa, o if the fear that he has from Hashem is out of fear of suffering, or of death, or of Gehinnom, this is an external, inferior form of fear of God. All of these actions, all of these results, they come about through the forces of the Chitzonim. Suffering comes about because of negative spiritual forces that come to afflict a person. Or, for example... Death. Death also comes about because of some negative, harmful influence in a person's life. If a person, if, if Adam Rishon hadn't sinned, there would never be death. Mortality came about because human beings sinned, which means that ultimately death comes about through sin, which is Chitzonim. And Gehinnom, obviously, is the same thing. It all comes about through the dinim that we cause ourselves through transgressing. So that fear itself is a very important tool to coming close to Hashem. It's a very important tool and way in which we connect to the sphere of Malchus, but it's also simultaneously very different, different, very dangerous as well. Because if it's a wrong form of fear, then it actually gives more sway, more room for the chitzonim that we're trying to overcome. And that would be bringing dinim onto Malchus, that would be bringing the oirla onto Malchus, and that itself would cause a, a, an interference between the Shefa coming down from the spheres through Malchus into the world. So that in the very way that a person attempts to serve Hashem through Yira can end up actually bringing about more klipos. And that's if he's engaged in the lower form of Yira, which is serving Hashem because of fear of getting punished. Umnam, ha'yira ha'ikaris, the Yira is Hashem. But the true form of fear is to fear God, and he uses here the name of God, Yud Kei Vav Kei. So perhaps he's suggesting that the main form of fear of Hashem should not be the fear of Aleph Dada Nun Yud, which is like Dinim, or Elohim, which would be Dinim, but rather to fear Yud Kei Vav Kei, that's out of awe for the greatness of Hashem. And this can be done in three ways. Okay? So what he's saying here is that a very important way, in addition to the two ways that he's discussed before about connecting to the meat of Malchus, emulating the way of Malchus, uh, is to uh, have fear of Hashem. However, the fear of Hashem can be dangerous and has a difficult side to it, which is if a person uh, leans towards the more inferior type of fear, which is the fear of punishment. Rather, a person should try and be developing a higher form of fear that is an awe of God. And he's going to elaborate on that in three ways to show us how we can try and get out of the lower form of fear of God, which is the fear of punishment, and actually elevate ourselves into having more of an awe of God. But before we do that, this does not mean to say that there are not times when it's appropriate to have the lower form of fear. For example, um, uh, we find, I believe it was with uh, Rebbe Yudah Hanasi, I believe it was Rebbe Yudah Hanasi, there's a similar teaching regarding Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. But in any case, um, when the rabbi was on his deathbed, his disciples came to uh, be with him during his last wor worldly moments. And, uh, and um, he kind of uh, gave him, or gave them, his last will and testament. And said, 
may your fear of God be like your fear of Basa Vadam, meaning may your fear of God be like the way you fear other people. And the students were all concerned. What kind of a blessing is that? That sounds like a very low level, that our fear of God should be like our fear of human beings. And the rabbi said, you should know, when a person sins, he doesn't look around to see whether God's looking. He looks around to see whether other people are looking. And if nobody else is looking, then he transgresses. So you see from here that even when it's a lower form of fear, where he doesn't actually fear God, he's using his fear of other people to kind of catalyze his, his strength to, with, to refrain from transgressing. That can be a very helpful thing. So I don't mean to say that we're negating altogether the idea of, of, of a lower form of fear. Sometimes a lower form of fear can actually serve as a preventative. And if a person would transgress, if it weren't for the fact that he says, wow, if I do this, I'm going to burn in hell. So even though that's a lower form of fear, in the end of the day, it is preventing him from transgressing. So it certainly has that value. But we should be trying and transcending above that. We should try to be, descend- to, 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 we should try to, be uh, to, tr- to transcend above that. It could be that, um, generally speaking, a person does have the fear of God, the fear of awe, the, the sense that God is present, and how could I possibly transgress in the presence of God? But when a person becomes embroiled with the desire to do that transgression, so at that point, the Yetzirah causes him to forget Hashem. He normally does think about Hashem, and he would normally feel Hashem palpably enough not to transgress. But the Gemara says, for example, A person doesn't transgress unless uh, a, a foolish spirit enters him. Which means that at the time of transgression, a person becomes kind of imbued with this spirit of foolishness, which is the Yetzirah, which is in, in, in inclining him to transgress in this way. And at that point, that Ruach Shtus comes and, forget, and causes him to forget Hashem. So normally, when he's not embroiled with his desire, he certainly says, how can I do this? Hashem is here, and he'll refrain from doing it. But sometimes a person becomes weakened for whatever reason, or the Yetzirah gets him off guard, and before you know it, he becomes embroiled with his desire to transgress. This Ruach Shtus prevents him from actually thinking about Hashem. And at that point, the lower form of fear becomes relevant. Wow, if I actually do this, those people are going to see me. Or, the, or, or people will find out. And, 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 and in this case, even though normally the higher form of Yira is, is better, and it might even be applicable for this person, in these instances where he's already been imbued with the Yetzahara, the lower form can be, uh, can be useful to prevent him from actually transgressing. So my point is, even though the author is saying that the higher form of Yira is certainly better, and the lower form of, of Yira is, 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 is harmful, it's dangerous because it would actually give an inroad into the, into the chitzonim. On the other hand, if a person has no choice, he should certainly not abandon that lower form of yira and make it applicable when necessary in order to avoid transgressing. But still, the actual, that take on things is a lower form, and we should be trying to find the higher form of yira. And he says there are three ways to do that. The truth is, glancing ahead, I actually see that there are four. If you notice, he says, This higher form of Yura can be attained by thinking about three things. And now he's got a list here. And the Rivi. So I'm not quite sure how to reconcile that, but maybe we can keep that along in mind as we go along. So the first one. The first one is as follows. He should constantly have in mind the greatness of the Creator on everything that exists. I would think what that means is he should be constantly aware of how great God is because He's the fashion of everything that a person sees. The greatest mountain is like a grain of, is, is, is less than a grain of sand for God. It's huge. It's immense. It's almost infallible for us. Think about everything that's involved in a mountain, all of the minerals and all of the plates and all of the lava things that are moving and all of the 
you know, the fertile fertility in the soil and the soil and everything that's growing on the soil and the things that are in the trees and everything that's in the tree and the insects and the fruits and the pit. Millions, mil- millions and millions of details are involved in that mountain. It's huge. And God is like above all of that. You think, wow, a mountain, that's phenomenal. Wow, God is great. As great as God is, right? he's no less concerned and involved with a centipede. And God gives the dexterity to the centipede to move those hundred legs simultaneously. So it moves up and down and here and there. Everything having to do with its digestive tract in the smallest, minuscule, microscopic way. So God's greatness is on everything from the largest part of creation to very smallest. And that should cause us to feel great wonder and a great awe for Hashem. So the person's constantly contemplating the grandeur of creation and therefore extrapolate back to the greatness of God, then that will con- there'll be a constant reminder for him to be living his life in awe of God, not in fear of becoming zapped, but in awe of God's presence and therefore right, unwilling, unable to entertain the possibility of transgressing in the presence of such a great God. For Hare Adam Yeri Minari, he says, look, a person is certainly afraid of a lion. Right? You wouldn't want to meet face to face with a lion. As brawny and strong as a guy you look like you are. You look like maybe you're a, an ex Navy man or something. Yeah? You wouldn't want to come face to face with a lion. Not tooth to tooth and not claw to claw. Nor. Not cheek to cheek. Not whisker to whisker. Nowhere near. Or the same thing with a dove. With a, with a bear, or minahonas, or from some other predator, or um, uh, enemy, or minahesh, from fire, minamapolis, or from a down a landslide. Veluhem shluchim katanim, but these things are just small little emissaries of God. The landslide, the fire, the lion, the bear. The snake, whatever they can be. We're afraid of them. But they're nothing but little, but they're, they're, they're minuscule little emissaries in the hand of God. So why shouldn't we be afraid of the king himself? And the fear of God should be on the face of such a person. As a result of his greatness, so he doesn't think it really seems. To, I don't think it really means to say we're afraid of being harmed by the lion. So we should certainly be afraid of being harmed by God. His whole point is that kind of sounds like the lower form of fear, right? And his whole point is we should not be operating on that lower form of fear, afraid of being punished or harmed by God. We should be thinking about being in fear, meaning in awe of God. So why is he using the example? I think the point. I think what he means is. We're afraid physically of the things which can cause physical harm to us, the lion. So we should certainly be in awe of the creator of that source of danger to us. Not because we're afraid of that source as a source of danger, but we should be in awe of the source that can create such things that cause us to be afraid. I think that's what he must mean. And that's why he says... The fear of God should be in our faces as a result of His greatness. Because we're afraid of these things even though they're very small. So the more so we should be in awe of the Creator of these, these sources of danger to us. V'yomar, he says, a person should say, How could a lowly person transgress against a master who is so great as this? If a, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a bear was coming to devour him, but because God suffers indignity, yeah? Meaning, God suffers silently 
the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the indignity of our transgressing against him without reprimanding us on the spot. So for that reason, we should be less afraid of him. We're afraid of the lion because it represents an immediate palpable danger to us. But we should be afraid of the lion and not God who's master over the lion. And, and that's just because God in his greatness withholds his punishment from us. That's why we shouldn't be afraid. On the, on the contrary, that's why we should be awe of God. Look at this lowly creature of God that causes me such fear. Yet God is much greater than that. God is much greater than that. And I'm deserving, and if he wanted, he certainly has in his ability to do much more than the, than the, than the lion, for example, the emissary. Why doesn't he do it? Because he forbears. So because God is forbearing, unlike the bear, God is forbearing, so that's a reason not to fear him? On the contrary, that's a reason to have great awe for him. In his greatness, he, he forbears, unlike the bear. So that should instill within us a type of awe for the greatness of God, awe and appreciation. So this would be one way of kind of initiating a train of thought which is going to instill within us a fear, meaning a higher fear of God, that would be awe. That's the first one. Okay? The second, the second kind of approach towards stirring up um, awe of God is kashegidme hashkahosoy tomid a person should be contemplating God's providential care always. Shutsofeu mabid bo God sees and overlooks a person and everything that he does. The servant will certainly be in awe of the master when the master's presence is constantly there near him. So he works, he does what he's supposed to, he doesn't slouch, right? He's constantly where the master is looking, the master is looking, the master is looking. He doesn't want to lose his job, he doesn't want to get whipped, or whatever the case may be. He wants to impress his master, so the master recognizes that he's doing a good job, and maybe will elevate him again, uh, elevate him from among the other servants because he's demonstrating his um, unique abilities and dedication to serving the master. In the same way, man is constantly in front of God, constantly in the presence of God, constantly under the eye of God, who is aware of all of his ways. So we should constantly be concerned of how could it possibly be that he will renege or become lax on his commandments. So if a person is constantly aware that God is constantly there, then he'll constantly be in line. And a person should get used to thinking this way so that when there becomes times of challenge, when all of a sudden he desires to do something which is off, Right? And so far, he's so used to thinking about the fact that God is here, he'll have a special safeguard to transgress. Right? And we're certainly like that. We go to work. Right? The employees are constantly you know, aware of to what extent the boss is around or the boss is not. And when the boss is around, or they have the sense that the boss is around. In fact, I know... It's a sixth sense. It's like a sixth sense, right? Yeah. And, and, but it makes them work harder. It makes them work more efficiently. It might also make them hate the boss. But you can have a benevolent, a benevolent boss whose presence um, uh, kind of inspires them to, to work better, or harder, more efficiently without the, the causing them to feel kind of an animosity or a dislike of the boss. Now, why does he refer to more of the slave and master than, say, the father and child? Um, uh, that's a good point. I guess he could have also mentioned that, right? Of, of, except that... Um, it could be that it's more likely for a son to take liberties even in his father's presence than a servant would in his master's presence. Well, On the more other likely hand, that a father will teach his son the proper ways than his master will teach the slave. Yeah, and there's also the love, you know, the element of love as well. 
and uh, the natural awe that a child might have for the parent, which might fit in better with what it seems that he's trying to display here, this, this demonstrate that we should be having like a, a, a loving awe for God and not necessarily a fear of God. I agree with you. That's interesting. But he doesn't bring that example. No, that's just one of the things I was thinking about when I was reading it. That's a good, yeah, it's a good thought. I never think about that. Why, you know, it, it would almost seem to be, if we're understanding the text correctly, a more appropriate analogy to bring. But perhaps, perhaps it's, it's not so much discuss, you know, kind of addressing the fear that the servant might have from the master, for example, being whipped for not working, but uh, the natural awe that a servant would have for the master be, 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 as far as their difference, let's say, roles are concerned or their different places in society might place them. It, it might, maybe it hard, it's hard for us to understand the analogy because we don't really have that reality. But perhaps in times of old when there were servants and there were masters, it wasn't just a feeling of, you know, of being afraid of being punished or, admoni or, or admonished by the, by the master, but it was a literal feeling of this person being in a much higher, superior position than me. And therefore I fear, feel inferior, uh, and therefore it would be incumbent upon me to serve my master because of his superiority over me. Maybe, you know, maybe that would fit in what we're saying here as well, that we should feel... On a certain level, certainly we're like children to Hashem. The, the Pazak says, Bonim atem Hashem You are children to God. But in terms of, but that's all nice and, and, and fine. But like I said, a child might also take liberty, uh, liberties in the presence of the father or might even feel that they're at some point entitled or empowered to, to replace the father. But a servant would not do that. A servant would be more innately kind of subservient to the, to the master and maybe that's what he's trying to, to illustrate here, that we should be feeling this type of awe like a servant. Yeah. Let's say, right, im kabanim, im kavadim. On Yom Kippur, right, we say, as, as God treat us as sons or as, as slaves. If as sons, have love for us as, as sons. And if as, as slaves, have mercy over as a master would have to the slave. So we're look like we're looking to God, like a neka Our eyes are like hanging on to you. In other words, are relying upon you. The servant is is entirely subservient to and dependent upon the master. And maybe that's the point that he's trying to demonstrate. Yeah, there was a, a former student of mine who used to learn here. He went back to America and he became quite uh, successful in the. Uh, um, I don't know what they call them, but uh, the, the healthcare industry. And he runs, I guess, hospitals or uh, maybe homes for the elderly. And he came to visit me. I was somewhere in the, in the mountains somewhere, and he's in New York. He came to visit me for the day from New York. And um, so we, he was ta we were talking about business and his office and what he does and so forth and so on. And so. <laughs> So it made me, I guess it's no novelty to you guys, but to me it was a real novelty. He pulled out, took out his phone, and, he's, and, he's, and he, was, <laughs> he was surveying the hospital, <laughs> room by room, quarter by quarter, office by office, and he could see exactly what all these different hundred employees were doing. <laughs> You've seen that? I guess it's you know, some kind of surveillance thing. The employees know that they're working in an environment where there are <laughs> cameras in every room, and uh, the employers uh, can see what's going on anywhere in the facility at any time. I said, were the cameras there to kind of keep an eye on patients in case of emergencies? You should be able to respond as quickly as possible or maybe somehow record um, any, um, you know, any mispractice or something like that? He said, no, it's there in order to make sure that the workers know they're being watched. So as, you know, as difficult as that sounds, I wouldn't want to be an employee in that scenario. I said, how do they feel about that? He said, they get used to it. They don't even think about it. You th see anybody looking at the camera? Let me show me room by word. See anybody looking at the cameras? Nobody's looking at the cameras. They do their job. But they know. All, all cameras are like that. That what? You don't... They're, they're hooked up to Wi-Fi. Yeah? Yeah. So that's not, but probably like a common thing in business yeah, nowadays. Yeah, nowadays yeah. yeah, I'm just saying at the time, it was novel to me. Um, this was maybe... Eight years ago or something but um, in any case uh, to a certain extent perhaps that's how we're supposed to view it as well using this case here he says we should be thinking like 
We are servants in the presence of God, and just as God, and 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 and, and we should, and just as the servant is aware of the master's overseeing eye, all the more so we should be aware of God's having an overseeing eye and being aware of what's going on at all times, so that we should be on our best behavior, knowing that God is there. And then I guess the point here would be not out of fear of retribution, but out of that which that it should instill within us an idea of awe. Right? I can't see behind me. God can see all around me, upside, downside, around side, and inside. That's how great that's how great God, how great God is. And therefore I should humble myself in his presence and not do anything that would be wrong or inappropriate in his presence. Not again, not because I'm afraid necessarily of getting zapped, although that's certainly true, a person could be punished. But the point is out of respect and awe for God. So that would be kind of the second train of thought for trying to make more palpable our feeling of having an awe for God's presence in our lives. The third one, HaGimel, HaGimel, kol v'chulan HaGimel, kol insofar as God is the source of all souls, v'chulan and all of the souls are rooted in the spheros. But somebody who transgresses will harm his chamber. And how will it be that he should not fear? How could he suffer the idea that the chambers of the king should become dirtied and sullied because of his evil deeds? And therefore, this would be a third reason, a third way to connect to a more elevated sense of, of Yerash Hashem, awe of Hashem. We've discussed in the past how you have the four or five Olamos, Adam Kadmon and Atzilos, Atzilus being like one which are two, and then you've got Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya, another three, for a total of four slash five, and how that corresponds to the different levels of soul, which are also like four slash five, right? There's Chai and Yechida, which are like the two points of the Yud, and then there's Neshama, Ruach, Ruach and Nefesh, which are four slash five. We discussed how the different five levels of the soul correspond to these different five Olamas, so that the spiritual essence of the physical essence of a person is in the physical world but the spiritual essence pervades the spiritual realm each level of soul corresponding to a different plane of those of those different worlds and we've discussed how the things since there's a connection with our physical bodies and those souls the things that we do in the physical world not only the actions but even the speech that we speak or the thoughts that we think insofar as they're connected to the different levels of soul, have an effect into the spiritual realm as well, like a fulcrum, right? Where you press here, it has a result there. So what he's saying here is we should be in great awe of God when we contemplate the fact that through, our, through the connection between our body and the different levels of soul, we actually inhabit to a great extent those higher realms. And the things that we do for good but also for bad have that leverage effect in the spiritual realm. And how could I possibly do something wrong when the consequences are so great, are so far-reaching? It's not like if I transgress here, it's limited to the physical confines of the area or the place or the thing with which I transgressed. It goes much beyond that. Through the power of the link between the body and the soul, when I transgress, the ramifications are very far-reaching. So when that gives me a more palpable sense of how great I am and how, in, how connected I am and how, much, how great the damage that I could cause could be as a result of my soul being rooted in that place, that would be a great deterrent. That would be a great deterrent for transgressing. And that should also place me in the mindset of being in awe of Hashem. In awe of Hashem. The author here seems to be, the wording here seems to be uh, addressing a, a different model than the one that we've been using, though. He says that he seems to be describing a model where the souls are connected 
into different spheros. And that a person who transgresses is going to be damaging the particular heichal or sanctuary of his soul. So he seems in my mind to be referring to a different type of a model where um, different souls are viewed as being located in different levels of the worlds. Until now we were discussing how you have four or five levels of soul, which each corresponds to four or five levels of the spiritual realm. But there's also an idea, and this is elaborated a bit, I believe, in Sefer Nefesh Chaim, that each person has their own soul. Some souls are higher and some are lower. So you can have souls which are kind of concentrated in a particular world. It might be Bria. For another one, it might be Yetzirah. For another one, it might be Atzilus. So that there's more of a specific connection between the entirety of a person's spiritual essence, the combination of his souls, and one particular world. So that a person who transgresses could be causing damage to the oilam, meaning the heichal, within which his soul is rooted. Okay? So it's using a different model, I believe. But the idea is still the same. The idea is still the same. And so when we think about how far-reaching our transgressions are, that they cause harm not only in the physical world, but even more so in the spiritual world, that feeling, that, that, that comprehension gives us a feeling of awe and act as a deterrent from doing it. Hadalid, and the fourth one, and remember he said he was going to enumerate three, but somehow a fourth one creeped in here. I've looked at different versions in the book, and they all seem to have the text saying that there are three, but uh, there are actually four which are listed. Does your version make any yes, point have, about this? Yes, um, we have a fourth, and I'm, we're trying to find the line where it is. I think... Um, Oh, let's see. Yeah, that, that so is. It, starts on our, it starts on our other page. Uh, is there any explanatory note as to why he says three, but there are really four? No, because it says even here, which is achieved by pondering three things. Yeah, right. That's the thing. The text says there are three things, and it lists four. It's not so... A little typo. Um, it's a typo which goes throughout, and there's no, no attempt to correct it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an odd thing. But in any case, let's just try and finish off with the fourth one. The fourth one... He should also see, contemplate, understand, have in mind, cognize the fact that his transgressions, they actually push the Shechina Milamala. I think what it means is it, it pushes the Shechina away from on high further causing it to be banished and dispelled, dispersed in the world. He should think, contemplate, consider, and ponder. How could he possibly be responsible for, for doing such an evil deed as to divorce the queen from her king, to send the Shechina into Golis even further? Lahafrid, Cheshek and Melech, Minamalka, and to separate the desire that naturally exists the affinity, the, 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 the connection, the attraction between the king and the queen. Right? That would be the upper spheros and malchus, or tiferes and malchus. This type of fear, not the fear of punishment, but the fear of the consequences of his deeds, in the different ways that he's explained here, this is the type of fear which will lead a person to perfecting this, um, this sphera of malchus. Not the lower form of fear, which is a fear of punishment, but rather the types of fear that we're talking here uh, um, you know, in, the, in this section. The four of them, right? The four should be, you should be aware of the greatness of God. That's the first one, just a second. The second one, um, the providence of God. The third one is the, um, um, the, uh, the far-reaching effects of his transgression in the spiritual realm. And the fourth one, which is kind of connected to that, which is how his, how, how his transgressions could cause a further banishing of Malchus from the other spheros. When a person thinks, therefore, about how, grand, how great God is and how God's providential care is over everything and how when I transgress I have such a great far-reaching effect 
and I could do something so bad as actually causing the office to be banished even further from the rest of the spheros, this should create within me a type of awe which would be a protection against transgressing and a more elevated way of serving God, not because of fear of being punished, but because of the fear of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the, of the damage caused from, from the outcome of transgressing. What were you going to say? I was going to say, maybe it's a four, it should have been like 3B, because yeah. you said right there, it's the far-reaching effects in the spiritual world yeah. of the transgressions that he does. Yeah. And not only you know, should he fear that he's damaging his own soul, but also pushing the love of Hashem further away from himself yeah, yeah. by transgressing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the fourth one is kind of like 3B. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, whether it's uh, 3, which is 4, or 4, or 3... The, 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 that's still that's the major message that um, we should therefore be trying to think about incorporating these ideas into our lives and our daily way of looking at life, our daily way of living, in order that it should become kind of second nature and something that we become so used to that if when we are presented with a, 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 a trial, the desire to transgress, mm-hmm. right, the you know the work that we've done in this area should be should should give us the fortitude we need in order to refrain from transgressing, even if that's not the case. However, we should still we should we should still consider it to be acceptable, plausible, and actually encouraged to default to the lower form of fear. The main thing is to to to, to do what we can to prevent ourselves from transgressing. Okay. Let's stop here, and then in the next few times that we meet, we'll try and finish off this chapter. <laughs>